So as people are, uh, are coming on board here, I'll just say a few kind of words of welcome and good afternoon to everybody. Um, the panelists, obviously, hello again, and the audience members that are joining us, so happy that you could be here. Uh, we at Force Space are delighted to work with Conversations in Contemporary Art, a convener, Maya Ray Oppenheimer, to bring you this 20, 2021 season of Sika, and we extend a warm welcome to today's guests, Hannah Klaus and Peter Morin, for this fourth episode in a series devoted to questions related to radical hospitality. Fourth space, physically located on unceded indigenous land in downtown Jajage, Montreal, is a university-wide platform focused on working collaboratively with our community across disciplines to produce moments of connectivity, um, process-based exploration, and conversation, which is why we are delighted to host this season of Sika. Before passing things off to Maya, just a few procedural notes. We are recording this event. It will be available on our website, concordia.ca slash four in the coming days. If you're on Facebook, we're live streaming there too at CU for Space. So feel free to make comments and questions there and we'll relay them over to Maya in here. The chat function is activated for all of you joining us in Zoom here for your reflections and your comments um, as you listen to this conversation and want to participate. If you have a question that you'd like um, our moderator Maya to address um, to the panelists directly, um, we ask that you pose it in the Q&A proper. This will signal to us that it's a question to be addressed publicly. It's all very formal. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to pass proceedings over to you, Maya, welcome. Thank you so much for that intro, as always, Anna, and welcome everybody to what is the fourth uh, talk in our SICA series this academic year. Um, Conversations in Contemporary Art is hosted and run out of the Department for Studio Arts at Concordia University, and I'm the convener this year. Um, as Hannah, or sorry, as Anna intimated, um, we would normally be gathering in, in downtown Chiochaga, Muniang, Montreal, in the bricks and mortar campus of Concordia University. And we are gathering in this Zoom capacity for the first time. It's the first time that Sika has had this digital component, and we're happy to be working with Force, Fourth Space in this, uh, in this capacity. And I would like to invite you to consider where you are zooming in from. One of the unique aspects that we are experiencing with this Zoom, um, Zoom hospitality is that we can welcome in guests into our conversation that we haven't been able to in the past because they are zooming in from other lands and across other waterways. So please feel free to warm up the space of the chat and say hello. You can see all of us, but we can't see you whilst we can sense you. Uh, we'd love to hear how you're feeling and the lands in which you're zooming from. Um, whilst we are connecting through this digisphere, uh, we are doing so with technology that is landed on land. The Zoom server for Canada is located in Tagoronto, Toronto, um, the traditional lands of um, the Mississauga of the Credits, the Anishinaabeg, uh, the Haudenosaunee, and the Hurong Wendat. Uh, one of our panelists, Peter, you are zooming in from Tagoronto, Toronto. Welcome, it's so nice to see you. And our other panelists, our guest, uh, Hannah Klaus, is zooming in from Siochaga. So we have a wonderful, wonderful multi, multi city representation here. Um, a few hospitality notes, literally. Um, the the conversation that we are pursuing this year in our SICA season platform is loosely called Radical Hospitality. And we are considering the placement or the juxtaposition of those two terms in a very open and exploratory way, inviting our different curators, artists, um, scholars, teachers to reflect on what that means in their practices, in their everyday lives. Um, but also thinking about what that means as a speaker series that is attached to an art school, that is attached to an institution, that is operating under constraints at the moment due to global pandemic, um, due to what the pandemic means in terms of our working lives, in terms of our personal lives, in terms of our emotional and physical health, um, also in a time of racial justice movements and actions that are going across the planet. So it's a very particular and earnest and important moment to be talking about this, this theme. And we're grateful for the remarks that Peter and Hannah will be bringing to this conversation. And I'm forecasting a different terminology that they'll be bringing to us rather than 
radical hospitality. Some of you may noted that in their remarks on the blurb for the talk, they'll be considering radical inclusivity, which is a, a very beautiful terminology. Uh, as intimated, you can use the space of the chat, as I see some of you already are doing, to uh, react to conversation points um, coming out of Hannah and, and Peter's work. Um, you can respond to one another, you can respond to myself, and I can relay things into the Q&A. Uh, but it's the Q&A function where you can direct comments um, and questions to the panelists. And uh, there will be a recording of this talk um, accessible via the Force Space YouTube channel. And I'll put a link to that in the chat for your later reference and for you to pass on to your, your peers and, and networks. So without further ado, um, it is my pleasure to introduce and say a little bit about um, our, our panelists. Um, I met Hannah through her, her work before I met her in person, which is a pretty typical narrative in, in the art scene. Um, I met Hannah in person, which again is also a very typical thing in the art scene, at a bar <laughs> downtown. Um, she was having a pint maybe, a beer, I can't remember, with some colleagues after a crit um, from the MFA materials and fibers and material practices students. Um, and I offer this as a story because it's nice to, I think, introduce people through you know, like the human exchanges that we have before we then talk about their institutional accolades. And I've gotten to know Hannah a bit more since she, she um, has become a, a valued colleague of mine. Um, she's joined the Studio Arts Department at Concordia University since August 2020. And I know her also to be a, a mentor, um, a very diverse artist, um, a careful thinker and a collaborator, a member of several boards and contributor to group shows, as well as constantly seeming to be working on solo shows and thinking about pedagogy. Um, and I'd like to pick a few things from her, her bio intentionally that um, many of you may have already read. Um, that Hannah is a Tinyangahaga, an English transdisciplinary artist and member of the Kintege Tinyangahaga Mohawks of the Bay of Kinte. Uh, she engages with the idea of space shaped by language, material culture, and place as transversal animate concepts. She employs Ongwe Huwenea to critique dominant histories and make present other narratives and ways of seeing. She's uh, participated in numerous shows, both group and solo. Um, Avid Akwene at the National Gallery of Canada is, is one of note. Some of you may see in her installation there. Um, that's one of the uh, earlier encounters I had with her piece when I came back to, to Canada, as well as Anabawin uh, with the Robert McLaughlin Gallery, curated by Daniel Pintup. And I, I brought props. Uh, the catalog is really, really beautiful. Uh, you can see how the work um, is in company with Mary McMaster in this photo. Um, and uh, has been in solo shows, including the Dunlop Art Gallery and at YYZ in Toronto. Um, she is also one of four co-founders of Daphne, a new Indigenous artist-run centre in Chiochaga, which is undergoing exciting developments. And in planning around what this conversation would, would be like, um, Hannah floated the idea early on of inviting Peter to be in conversation with her about her work. And it's so wonderful to be hosting friends who've known each other for a long time to talk about work and where their thoughts are going. Um, and I also met Peter Moore through his, his work before I, I met him on the Zoom recently. I also bought props. This book, The Land That We Are, that has Peter Moore on the cover is a really beautiful publication. Um, and it's not mentioned in his bio that writing is, is part of, part of um, the way that Peter thinks through ideas and practice and relationality. So I hope you don't mind me adding that, Peter, um, that your, your writing is really wonderful and thoughtful. Um, and to say a few things from the bio, um, Peter Morn is a, a Talta Nation artist and curator and writer. Um, throughout his artistic practice, uh, Morn investigates the impact zones that occur when Indigenous practices collide with Western settler colonialism. Morin's artworks are shaped and reshaped by Talton epistemological production and often take on the form of performance interventions. Um, exhibitions range internationally from London and Berlin, Singapore, New Zealand, Canada and the US. Um, and uh, in 2016, Morin received the Natitian Foundation Award for Outstanding Achievement by a Canadian mid-career artist and currently holds a tenured appointment in the Faculty of Arts at the Ontario College of Art and Design in Tagoronto. So I will hand over to both of you. Thank you so much for contributing to our platform and expanding your, your Zoom time to share your thoughts with us.
Yo, Maya. Thank you very much. Uh, so, hello, everybody. Greetings. Hi, Peter. Thanks for Hi. coming. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do we start this? Um, I think we start by saying, how, how are you doing today? <laughs> I hope everybody's doing well. It, uh, I don't know. It's, uh, it's nice. It's gotten colder out. I think the season's starting to get, become the, the way that it's supposed to be, which is good, you know. But um, yeah, I think we've been doing a lot of talking about what this might be and uh, a lot of thinking about it, which is really why I wanted to include you in this. You're someone that I like to talk about ideas with, and I think we have some good conversations. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> yeah, this, so adding this one in, adding this one into the <laughs> series of conversations that we've had, and Let's see how it goes. It's been a privilege to chat with you always, my friend. I am, um, but also, how are you doing today? <laughs> well, I started the day by dropping my coffee, so it didn't start too well. But uh, I didn't break the mug, so like you know that that's looking on the bright side of things. I would have been sad if the mug had broken. And uh, I think, you know, we're going to have a good conversation, so. Yeah, yeah, we are. We, uh, it's already started. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm curious about one thing. I, maybe this is, uh, you know, also um, just me thinking through what it, what it, how it sounds to hear the bio. You know? Heavy. <laughs> Heavy, yeah. Like in your, in your thinking, making, practice, like, did you ever imagine it was going to be so expansive and cover over such a period of time? Well, you know, I was really, you sort of realize when you do these bios and when you put your slides together, like I've been doing this for a while now, you know, mm -hmm. things add up. So I think that's, that's a good thing to sort of look back and see how things add up. Um, and uh, we, we, we tend to keep busy, don't we, you know? I mean, I think making art is about, is about making art, uh, but I think that our practice involves more than just making objects and filling space. I think we fill space in, in many ways. And the uh, responsibility I've always felt is to contribute to community and feel like, like you're able to help, help others along the way, you know? So that takes many forms and uh, it, leads to lovely relationships. That's how I met you through the Aboriginal Curatorial Collective, right? And that's led to other projects that we've done on our own, which is wonderful, and friendships. Um, but at the same time, we were able to, you know, try and help move things along for other people, which I think is important. I think that's part of what uh, happens with teaching as well, you know? Um, it's the idea of sitting on boards uh, and, and uh, trying to start new projects. So, so how about that radical hospitality, friend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. Tell me about it. That's tell right. Me. That's right. Well, I was asking you to tell me about it. And you know, I, I was asking Maya to tell me about it. And I think also uh, Shelly, um, Shelly Willette is uh, someone who you met, who's my teaching assistant. She's a master's student. And I was talking to her about it. How does this work? And uh, I think it was, it was, well, let me share some slides and we'll have some pictures happen while this goes, because that's what we're yeah. supposed to do. Yeah, that's great. Please do, please. And what are all those folks telling you about radical hospitality? Well, you know, that's, that's where I, I was sort of like, why is this sort of find, I'm, I'm I'm not comfortable with this term. And uh, I think it's the word hospitality, you know? Um, certainly in, in principle, I, I understand it, but I think it, it feels somewhat like uh, the responsibility is more on the host mm. for the hospitality. And it's kind of one directional in that way. And if, and that's where um, you brought up the idea of radical inclusivity, which I hadn't known before. I hadn't heard of before. And saying that that's something that uh, 
has been talked about with Cheryl Lerondell's work. And so I sort of looked that up a little bit and I thought, hmm, this seems maybe a little bit more, but it's it, inclusivity, it's, it's opening it up, but it, it, it allows for room for, for reciprocity, for participation in all parts, I think. Yeah, there, I mean, there's something about uh, indigenous knowledge here and how indigenous knowledge is sort of framed as well, right? Like when you're talking about all of the emphasis on the host, you know? And then the, even that word radical kind of is like a little bit like, I mean... It it's not cold. so radical anymore. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's really not. It's yeah. a, and I think it, yeah. it, you know, maybe it, maybe it has its uh, sort of history or emergence in our conversations as scholars, you know, because we both work for universities, um, from anarchist, anarchist thinking and leaning and tradition, like that idea of radical is something is like putting your energy and weight behind something that is exactly against the systems of power which are endeavoring to silence, you know? But I agree with you, that word hospital, hospitality, hospital, it's a very strange word. Well, you, yeah. you know, it, it's, uh, when you, if it's hospitality, that then implies the guest, right? That you're, you, you are a guest. And when I hear that I have hospitality and guest, I, I just always think of that, that expression that we are guests on this land, you know, that comes up with territorial acknowledgements. And then it's also that idea of, well, the uninvited guest on the land, right? So and it's sort of, the, I don't know, the somehow radical inclusivity, it seems more intentional to me. Yeah. And, I, I... And maybe the radical gets framed more in the idea of how to shape the inclusiveness, perhaps. It does. It does. Um, well, I mean, I mean, uh, you know, I come to this idea, radical inclusivity, uh, because it was shared with me by Cheryl Rondell and um, Shirley Bear. Uh, so two real powerhouse uh, indigenous women, indigenous women artists. Um, I think that that piece is really important to to acknowledge yeah. as well. Yeah. And I, I mean, uh, Cheryl um, is currently doing her PhD, uh, but she writes about radical her understanding and practice and application of this idea of radical inclusivity, of radical inclusivity in her master's thesis. Um, she just got her master's from um, OCAD through the Digital Futures Program. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just think it's really, I, lo I love this piece about like, how do you want to share space? Like, do you want to share space enough so that like, that it actually hurts, you know? Like the exact opposite of somebody who maybe you don't even feel safe with, right? But you still prioritize that there is a need and a, a, for relationality. There mm -hmm. still is a need for um, uh, working together kind of thing. It's really important uh, and, mm. and um, provocative, you know? Um, well, you, you'd asked me to uh, kind of pull up some work that you felt spoke to these different things that we mm -hmm. sort of talked loosely about, uh, that we'd structure this around, loosely structure this around. Yeah. So, you know, I, I pulled up this one because I think for one, it's an image that's been seen a fair bit given that it was just in Abadakwane at the National Gallery for the last, the last year, basically. And, um, and it's one that, that talks about coming together. To me, this is sort of this uh, invitation or inclusion was part of, of what I was thinking in, in making it. And uh, the idea of, of, in my work in these installations, the idea where installation interests me, it's the possibility to transform a space and really invite people into the space. Um, it's that idea that if they can enter into the space and enter into my ideas, it's a way of perhaps communicating. It's a strategy for communicating with them. So in this work, uh, Our Minds Are One, it uh, comes out of 
an exhibition that was based on the 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 dish and one spoon wampum belt and uh the curators lisa myers and rochelle dickinson had invited three anishinaabe artists and three haudenosaunee artists to respond to that wampum belt and we had different sessions with teachings with alan corbier who's a anishinaabe historian and now phd and with rick hill who's another knowledge keeper from six nations on what are wampum belts and wampum belt protocols and in particular the wampum belt with a dish and and one spoon and uh what really stuck with me i guess the dish and the spoon is is the great lakes treaty with um between Haudenosaunee and anishinaabe for basically land sharing sharing the land sharing the resources and uh it's the idea that we we share this territory we offer the best of what we have to the the others who are on our territory we always leave something in the bottom of the dish for the next person you don't leave it empty and um it's it's sort of good i guess you could say good hospitality it would it would come back to hospitality that idea of, of being a good host so maybe i'm wrong about that <laughs> but it is the idea of inviting people in so um with this, I, uh, I got interested in, in that idea of the dish and the spoon and um, was interested in how it related to Haudenosaunee um, decorative uh, decoration on regalia and beadwork. And the images that I know from that are the, the sky dome, which is basically a semicircle on top of a, a line that's, that's repeated. It's the idea of the sky dome, the celestial dome within which we all live. And uh, I was listening to Rick give his presentation and um, he was talking about the symbols and many different uh, wampum belts and, and sort of iconography and, and said that this idea of the dish is common throughout many nations and that it can also be framed as an hourglass shape, as sort of a, a figure eight uh, or even the, the circle. And uh, I went and asked him afterwards if then this idea of the sky dome would be something that could relate to the dish. And he said, absolutely. It's, you have the dish like this, what happens if you turn it over? It becomes the dome. Wow. And so I was so excited. I, I <laughs> you know, I just uh, sort of hairs raised up in my arms, yay. <laughs> and uh, it's the idea that I, that I could, I could now create this dome. So I wanted to, to make this uh, the sky dome, the idea, the vision of, of the world three-dimensional. So taking it off as sort of the flat representation and something you can enter into. And uh, the thing that I love about this sort of installation is that it's really active, it's moving. So I managed to include some video in this presentation so you could see it moving and active. And that's the, the important thing with I think one of the most important things within wampum belt teachings is that they're they're active agreements that continue on in time you have to continually renew them they aren't static it's that idea that it uh that the words are meant to last as long as the sun shines the water flows and the grasses grow i i have a i have a few questions i guess i guess but i'm i'm just uh uh, there's, a, there's a few things that I love hearing you talk about this work and I love uh, the chance, the continued chance I get to like encounter and be changed by this, uh, your thinking uh, as well as your making. And maybe just something a little bit more on radical hospitality and ra radical inclusivity because, you know, we're trying things out, right? Um, it's starting to feel like they're, you know, what if you put them together like two sides of a coin? what happens to your thinking there? Like, what if they're actually, you know, touching ideas as opposed, or aligned ideas? Mm -hmm. Does that, that piece about hospitality or like taking response, taking too much responsibility for the, for the guests? Well, I, I think maybe it's, it's an idea of perhaps what I, I associate with sort of, uh, Western hospitality, perhaps, um, the idea of, of, uh, 
of the rules for the host to follow in order to to be a good host sort of thing um but i think that at its core yes it is something that is inclusive i would hope so because it it does come back to being about uh a, mo a shared moment of time in which you build a relationship right yeah that's a nice way to put it a shared moment of time yeah to build a relationship like yeah uh yeah. so like if i think about that and apply it you know you know just because i'm looking at these folks standing in your beautiful installation like that is a shared moment hey yeah yeah well that that's the great thing about this piece particularly is that um i've made these suspended installations before and um generally the the threads will go to the floor um in fact like like this one the threads will go to the floor to the ceiling and to me that was important because um it's talking about that connection between earth and sky it's it's again a relationship and um again i i sort of i relate these to that idea of, of wampum belts but in that piece, the dome, um, it was specifically constructed so that people could enter inside. So the threads don't, don't touch all the way. You have to kind of duck under a little bit, but you're, you can go inside and, and be a part of that, that space. So that's sort of what's, what's special about that one. And uh, I think it was, it's something people appreciate definitely because um, it becomes a transformational space, you know? and uh, the shadows become a part of it too. I love that piece, the, the piece of, uh, around, it becomes a transformational space, you know? And that, that um, acknowledgement of, of coming into concert or resonance with, your, with that particular work, but a majority of your work for sure, um, I think people leave shifted because there's such an expansiveness to to what I experience you know I experience an expansiveness when I come into contact with your work right um, and the possibility of turning the dish over like nobody really ever talks about that like, you know, <laughs> like I know this is this was a beautiful realization when I when I came across that you know that was a, a beautiful gift that he he gave us in thinking about that way well, the, the inclusivity or hospitality also, you know, it needs to include the animal, the non-human beings as well, right? Yes. yes. So, like, if you yes. are spilling the, if you are taking the bowl, the dish with one spoon, I'm gonna, you know, I'm just thinking out loud here. So, <laughs> not trying to be, I'm not trying to be offensive to people or, you know, anything. <laughs> it's a whole other talk. But, do you know, like... Yeah. In that agreement, like taking some some food out of the bowl and giving it to the animals as well, like uh, what a beautiful thing. Well, I think, and, and to me that, when I talk about that piece also, it brings up uh, the Ohadu Gari Odakwa, the mm. words before all else. And that's also known as the Thanksgiving address for the Haudenosaunee. Um, and it's one in which we, we acknowledge and thank all parts of, of the different worlds, the two-leggeds, the four-leggeds, the medicines, the growing things, the green things, the skies, um, the, 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 the stars, the constellations, everything is, is acknowledged and thanked. And I think that's important to remember, you know, it's, it's uh, there's a, a wholeness um, in, in a way of looking at the world. So I think it's, it's something I try to put forward in, in these installations. Yeah. Tell us about this one. Tell us about um, Yeah, well, this is actually uh, one that's getting ready for an exhibition, if ever it can open with COVID, um, at the Musée d'Art Contemporain Montréal. So it's called Chant pour l'eau, Kinosipi, and that's a water song. Uh, Kinosipi, it's the name of the river that the images are, are based on. I created it for an exhibition at Joliet, and um, Joliet's about an hour outside of here. Okay. Um, it's, it sort of acknowledges the Tikamek territory. I think it's actually 
Algonquin, but there's so many Atikamekw people living there that it's, it's sort of more the territory. And it's something where I wanted to, to uh, cre I was going to create something for this exhibition and uh, there's the river sort of flowing really close to the museum. And I thought this would be beautiful to do for, for this space. I created another one before in uh, Mi'kma'ki in, in um, uh, sort of Gaspésie territory, northern, northern Quebec, and uh, wanted to create it again. So, but it becomes different because it's a different river and it's a different song. So it's a way of acknowledging the territory of, of offering something to, to the territory to say thank you for having me be, be on your territory. I, the idea of the river water is something that I, I chose because it's as common to all of us. We all, we all share this, we're all a part of that. Um, but also rivers are very different for, for each place, each space, the territory is specific to different people. And so um, I, I, I sought out uh, someone who could be, who would want to collaborate with me on this, um, who's a singer and uh, ended up mm. through the Friendship Center, finding, finding someone, getting, getting referred to someone who was interested in this. And it's uh, uh, Karine Rosania Echaquan. And um, so I met with, with Karine and uh, told her about the project. And she, uh, she actually composed me a song. She's a storyteller wow. who talked for a long time, but she actually composed me a song based on her experiences of being on the water with her grandfather in his canoe and he would collect birch bark to, to make canoes. So uh, that's the collaborative element in this. I, the, the, the actual physical way it works is I, I, record, I record the song and put it into the computer and it's the readout on the computer, sort of the, the, sound, the sound waves on the computer that then just a small part of it gets transposed to the threads, basically. And on the images on the, are printed on the discs are of the river. And in this case, I also included birch bark um, for the, to, to talk about the, the, the times on the river with, with her particular song and, and her grandfather. So, Mm. It um, becomes a, a sort of a, it's almost someone said you could include it in a sound, in, in an exhibition, like a, as a sound piece, but it, it doesn't have the song with it, but it, it is the song. It's, it's a physical manifestation of the song, basically. Wow. So, so yeah, but I bet it, I, I, I love the fact, and it's important to me that it is very specific to a particular place and and people um and this one is is a tikamek and uh it was 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 done with Karin, which was was lovely yeah well the, the i'm just thinking about the last time we had a chat chance to visit about your work uh you said something really beautiful um about the shadows ah yeah yes um I think, like I showed with the other one, these are very animate pieces um, and uh, the light reflects off of them. So there's sort of these, these highlights that, that come as if it sort of sparkles on the water. But then also for me, the shadows are important. It's, uh, it's the ancestors, it's the presence of ancestors so that it really becomes more of this, the space becomes really full uh, with sort of, um, past and present coexisting within the one space. Yeah. That's the, uh, that's the, uh, I think I'm going to keep going back to the trying these ideas out, right? The ho mm. radical hospitality and radical inclusivity. Um, well, I guess, so the, uh, I guess like these the are, manifest oh. so you go ahead, you finish. Oh, well, so I was going to just uh, say that uh, it seems like the acknowledgement of ancestors in the space is, a, is aligned with a radical inclusivity, right? Because colonization yes. also like try, you know, colonization is, you know, for the most part, done a really good memory wipe uh, on who ancestors are and what they have done for us, you know? Um, I, uh, I'm curious too, uh, uh, I do have a follow-up question, but what, what were you going to say? Um, 
that idea of radical hospitality, radical inclusivity. Um, I think these are maybe ways of collaboration um, is, is part of that. I, like, I guess this is why I chose this. It's that mm. idea of collaboration as, as within the, the creative act as being part of that idea of inclusivity uh, coming in as well within the production, within the process of making um, is interesting to think about and to acknowledge. I think it's important to acknowledge. So, yeah. Okay, My, I have a follow-up question. <laughs> <laughs> go, go, go. Have you uh, ever had one of these uh, installations outside? Like what? Like, like this? Where, yeah, like where the shadows are actually on, following, falling on the land? Like what happened I have there? not, I have not my friend because you know what, and I just was talking about this with someone else who wants to show one of these, these works in a show uh, actually in, uh, in, in your part of the, the, the world in, in Dorondo. Uh. Uh, yeah. Um, air vents are a little bit my, my nemesis with these because they're so delicate, like the, they're so lightweight that it doesn't take anything to have them be, you know, that they're just naturally animate that way. But once you get sort of air um, going on them, if the wind comes on them, the tangle is, is fast and furious, definitely. So there'd have to be a way to, to, to think about doing that, maybe recreating it with different materials that uh, are a little bit more resistant to then to then have it outside, if I were to have it outside. There'd be ways to adapt it, yeah. but to have literally this outside, that would, not, that would not be good, no. Have you ever thought about your, like I'm looking at it now, you know, and just also like, it's making me think about beadwork as well. Like, is there thinking, relational thinking to beadwork with these works or, because it's like a giant beadwork and the threads <laughs> of course are like, yeah, right? And the threads Yeah, 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 yeah. No, definitely, you know, definitely. The, thre the threads are lineages, you know? Yeah, um, the thread's the connector. It's the connection, like I said, between, mm -hmm. between earth and, and sky. And the thread is chosen to be visible. Um, it's not meant to be, you know, uh, sort of that kind of fishing line or something that's meant to sort of fade away. It's meant to be visible. I want those lines to be present because to me that's talking about relationship and that's, that's important. Um, but definitely beadwork. Like I said, I, I kind of relate them as, as coming out of wampum belt teachings mm -hmm. um, where it's this idea of talking about relationships with, with uh, the world. But I mean, the, the, the word uh, in, in Ganyogeha for, for wampum belt means a uh, river made by hand. It's something that uh, wow. Darren Bonaparte, Darren Bonaparte um, historian from Anglo-Sassani taught me. And um, wow. I just thought that was beautiful, you know? Um, it's also that connection with rivers, why this is, is water song. Um, rivers are the connectors between communities and uh, it's a moving, active body of water. You know, like I said, these are meant to be active living agreements. So it's not something that is simply made and then go to put in a drawer. So now that happens with museums. <laughs> but they're supposed to be living memory aids uh, for living agreements. Uh, the idea of treaty before we had the word for treaty, you know. So in that sense, yeah, I mean, wampum belts are woven. Um, they're, they're beadwork before we had beads. They were shells uh, shaped to be cylindrical bead forms. And uh, it's something that the, the design, the size, the pattern were all decided and everything means something between the two parties who are, who are coming to an agreement and making this together. So, um, Yes, there's, there's definitely a connection to beadwork that way. I think in making these, it's, it's the process, um, planning, planning them out, but the discs all get threaded onto the, onto the threads and uh, are placed individually into where they, they need to go to pull up the pattern um, of where it 
where what the final image will be yes oh my god i just i'm just so <laughs> you know i know I, there's some other images we're talking about today too but i i just i also return to that the piece that you shared with me about smoke uh, uh, and how the, I think it was, you mentioned it was Helen Corbier who talked about how the smoke also is considered in the wampum design. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. yes. Actually, it's it's Darren Bonaparte. Again. Oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, Darren. It's Darren. okay. Yep. Um, but yes, it's part of the idea with with wampum belts that, well, the, the, I'm always kind of thinking that with the weaving terms, you've got the warp and the weft. And I believe it's the warp, which are the threads that it you goes, are weaving on. Yeah. Oh, okay. We, we, so what are the ones that you are weaving onto? The weft. The ones that are held. That's the, okay, that's the weft. Yeah. So when you, when you cut the weft from the loom um, to, to, to have the belt, uh, those lines are left long on either end. And it's the idea that uh, the agreement continues on, that it's, it's meant to show that it, it's, it's not finished, that, that the agreement continues on. Um, I also think of this, uh, if we think of this as a river, it's like the direction of the river that is mm. going from east to west. Um, and, and then the other directions that come into play is that the shells that come from the bottom of the ocean are part of this act and then the smoke from the pipe that is smoked when once the words are sealed into the wampum belt rises up to the sky so that you have the connection between uh, the, the, the bottom of the ocean and up to the, the top of the sky world and then the east and the west so it, it gathers all of the directions within to that one form basically. So it's complete. It's complete with us to make it complete and to keep it living. Yeah, because yeah, it need, it needs a human body. It, there's, and there's so many different facets of consideration for how a human body engages with the work, like the, well, with think, your with your work and also with the work. <laughs> well, I think yeah, you can think of it as being like we're we're a part of it. It's it's a part of us. These agreements, right? They're not independent of us we need to enact them and, and respect them and keep them alive. So, yeah. And we have to protect that. That's a, like, we have to protect how it is that idea and the practice of this is a part of us. Well, know? we need to care for it. Yeah. Right? So mm. it has to be cared for. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm moving this one along. Yeah, 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 cool. Because <laughs> otherwise we just keep talking. <laughs> I know. Well, I yes, we, you did invite me to good. visit. <laughs> Which is good. And I did invite you. And I'm so glad you're doing this with me. So, so yeah. So um, this piece uh, I chose, it was thinking, uh, the next topic we were talking about was non-colonial versus decolonial. Oh, yes. Okay, okay. Now, I don't know if I didn't look at the participants. I don't know if we have... David Garneau here or not, but I have to say, I didn't go back and reread the text, but he's the one that I got that term from, non-colonial. And you seem to be familiar with the text as well when, uh, when, when I mentioned it to you, Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Familiar-ish. Familiar I, I'm not, yeah. my, I have quarantine brain today, so I'm like, Yeah, you didn't reread I'm it either. <laughs> I'm working through it. I'm working through it. I'm working That's through the it. quarantine brain. <laughs> anyway. This one, I, I think it's that idea of non-colonial versus decolonial. Again, decolonial is one of those words that we just hear all the time now, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to have this go because it plays for a while um, as we talk. Wow. So, wow. so the, the decolonial, I think of this as more of a decolonial work because it's really working with colonial imagery and then it eventually deconstructs and replaces it with indigenous imagery. Um, mm. I think the non-colonial idea might be more these other ones that I showed before, these installations like the water song that are really in center being an you know, in indigenous making, indigenous thought, 
um, with the wampum belts and uh, the, the rivers, et cetera. And the, this one is, is sort of, it's more of this kind of a, a literal deconstruction. So as you can see, well, William Morris, a uh, Victorian uh, textile artist, um, so much more than that. I mean, he was just a, a producer of, of design and images for, for the home, basically. Um, but would always, one thing that I thought was interesting about him is that he tried to really promote the idea of uh, having their own specific flowers and plants from Britain, he's British, in the designs and, and flora and fauna that were, that were indigenous to his territory, as opposed to going and just taking the images from India or taking the images from somewhere else. He really tried to propose that. But then his company got big, and as far as I can tell, uh, other designers came on board that didn't weren't necessarily they, like the designs become kind of fantastical at, at 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 times where they don't seem to really be following so closely actual living living plants. So anyway, I just have a bit of a fascination with him uh, earlier on. I think in looking at the idea of pattern, and and to me that was kind of in looking at. British pattern and indigenous pattern and seeing if we could bring them together is something I was looking at earlier in my work and uh, relating it to identity. And so a friend of, of yours, Tanya Willard, oh. <laughs> <laughs> who's part of Bush Gallery, which is on your shirt, was, uh, I think now she's focusing more on her art from what I can see. I haven't really been in touch with her, but she was doing a curatorial residency at the Kamloops Gallery when she approached me. And she'd seen an earlier work that I'd done um, and wanted to, to show it or recreate it or sort of refer back to it somehow, which was called Pine. And it was a projection of a William Morris slide of a, a, a slide of a William Morris carpet onto pine needles. Mm. And, uh, and, and then another paper piece that was projected with shadow onto the wall. It was one of my first installations. And, mm. um, I said to her, well, I'm not really interested in re-showing that work because it's, it's so old, but I'd, I would, if I'm going to revisit it, I would like to do something where I did animation. I was thinking of sort of bringing this to life. So that, that resulted in this work, Interlacings. Interlacings. Um, and uh, basically I researched with her about plants that were indigenous to um, the Sequepam territory where Kamloops Gallery is, and uh, integrated those into this, this animation um, so that the, the, the Victorian design is gradually replaced by all of these um, indigenous plants that are all edible. So it's the idea that, that sort of these, these plants serve a purpose and to kind of acknowledge and honor them within this this carpet as, as well. And then the pine needles around it are uh, a reference back to that initial installation um, and the forest floor. And Tanya was saying, no problem. We have lots of pine needles around here. And I had a pleasure just going out to grab all of these fresh, fresh needles. And we just put them around the installation. And uh, yeah, so that this usually goes on a loop and, and continues on. Um, uh, on, on the floor of, of the gallery as if it were sort of this carpet, but also this um, never ending sort of movement and, and, and well that goes down into. And I want to say Scott Benison Abandon was, was my technician for this, for the animation. He was absolutely amazing. So it was, it was fun. Yeah. I'm a little bit like, you know, I was like watching the video and getting entranced. And then I was getting hungry. And then I realized, <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized, oh, there's, oh, there's some uh, cran uh, high bush cranberries in there, blueberries, huckleberries, strawberries. There's, there's salmon berries. Yeah, I, I got out the list, but then some of these are, it's, I, I don't, I didn't, I didn't actually get the list to look at the names, but that's why the, there's like the, the roots that you see, because it's the roots that they would, they would cut up. And they do cut up and eat. That's like the delicacy. Um, the sort of bulb is is uh, is something that she's was saying. It's like kind of like a like a mashed potato when you eat it, but 
you know, tastes different, obviously. So yeah, yeah. Hunger is there for sure. The land provides. <laughs> so. Also, Tanya Willard is my go-to person for mailing me uh, pine needles. So I oh really? Yeah. She goes yeah. that far. That's yeah. great. I'll well, when I was uh, I was making um, uh, I was teaching uh, pine needle baskets for one of my how to you know the structure of pine needle baskets, the technique, and you know honoring those technologies with students. Uh, Tanya sent me three bags three bags of amazing yeah which was really <laughs> great yeah and I, I think there's something about time here too right and um i mean because it's you know several cl turning clocks here that i'm we're all seeing in the video right in the animation and colonial like decolonial and non-colonial are, are are actually referring to time as well like and i don't know if, how much work we need to do around still kind of like uh, articulating the complications of the of time and our experience of time and our respective bodies experiences of time right um, you don't correct. know how much more work we need to do about that well, yeah because I don't you know how much have we how much work have we actually done to this point and I think David's <laughs> offering David's offering of uh, of the term non-colonial yeah is one of the more um uh, uh known sort of offerings around uh, uh uh investigating the complications of time on our indigenous bodies in this place now known as canada right mm. um decolonial is an interesting phrase for me and i you know spend a lot of and I, and an action that i try to do all the time yeah yeah um but that also specifically refers to a kind of time, right? Colonization is a very particular kind of time in Canada. Yeah. Okay. But I think, I think there's, there's a lot of work still to be done about the idea of time, about the concept oh, yeah. of Me indigenous too. time, you know? Okay, good. I thought you were saying yeah. we didn't have to do that anymore. So I'm like, I'm all about that. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's not, I'm not, definitely no. all about that. But no, I, no, that's not I, what I'm saying. Um, Okay, good, good, good. Because yeah, David, I think in his in his text, and we should try and post that that article. Um, if I were like chat multitasking, I would, but uh, um, maybe after. But um, I I actually relate the idea of uh, I, for me that that idea of non colonial. He was really relating it to performance art. Um, so I was kind of interested to see how ah, I I kind of identify with this, and I want to how would I identify this with um, installation, my installation, which is what got me thinking about it. And, um, and yeah, so that, that was his article, but in talking about time, I always go back to, to sort of my inspiration, Deborah Doc's mm -hmm. daughter, mm -hmm. um, yeah. as, as an author that is someone who just writes brilliantly about, about the notion of, of time, the differences in the, in the concept, the construct of time between indigenous and non-indigenous thought and how it really just is underpinning and, and underlines the whole way that 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 everything works you know so yeah there's also the impositions of time right on, on our bodies and our making you know but like for me just thinking about what you said and um I say your works are like very active performers, are agents of change in that in a gallery environment. You know, that sort of slight movement uh, of of uh, transparent disc uh, and it's it's meeting or matching of the shadow. Right, uh, it's a very uh, important agent of of a change and transformation. Yeah. Um, how does time meet our bodies? You know, like I'm today I'm was spending, you know, I had the privilege of spending the morning thinking, like reflecting on 20 years of making. Like, that's strange. That's a strange sort of meeting of time and body, you know? Well, I think it's interesting because I, I don't really do performance. I did it a little bit with you in one of the <laughs> collaborations. You got me in there, which was beautiful. Um, but at the same time, I, I tend to, because I've, I've thought about this before, I, I, I certainly am not a performance artist, but I think it goes into the process 
and that's part of also that that uh, goes with with the idea of, of being a bead worker is the process, the time that goes into beading. And in, in my installations, it's the process. I feel like time is very present just from seeing that finished work. You, you realize the time, the body, the, the hand that's gone into making it basically. So um, I think that's an interesting aspect of, of what I do as well. Oh, it's, it's for like something, sometimes it's the, for me, encountering and coming to stand in your installations, that aspect is sometimes the most profound for me. Like I'm the most affected <laughs> by it, right? Um, and the, like the thing about colonization in particular is like, it is a very truncated uh, 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 sense of time. Right, so at some point, these threads to me like really connect me to all. And I'm standing in your installation, and the threads are connecting me to all the ancestor artists who use threads. You know, mm. and I mean, we're using the English word thread, right? But originally, that uh, that uh, device, you know, is sinew, which comes from the animal, which, you know. It's a very long process of, of thinking and feeling through time. Or it might um, be roots. Or roots, absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It's, 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 the, it's the connecting line, which is interesting. It's the connecting line. This is yeah. one of my favorite ones. I have <laughs> a lot of favorites of yours. But... <laughs> That's what I wanted you to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Let's visit about this one too. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is um, this is called words going from one place to another, and uh, again, it was sort of this idea of I think it's more of a deco decolonial work in that it's coming. It's really I, I'm really working with the colonial form. It's a historical plaque taken from the the, commemor the commemorative rock. Um, that sits on the McGill campus here in Jaltjage that talks about the um, possible site of Hushalaga. So this, uh, when I was teaching at McGill, I'd walk by this each, each, uh, each time I went by and, and sort of went to, I'd go to visit with the rock and just think about, you know, what is, what is the story behind this plaque, the story that's not being told behind this plaque? Because the plaque is a very straightforward, it's the story that's still being told in my, my children's elementary school history text that uh, talks about the, the discovery of, of Montreal and Jacques Cartier and the village of Hochelaga. So, so I, I did a series of work on this and it was 2017 when those, when the, uh, sort of 375 celebrations for, for Montreal were happening. And, and also when uh, whatever number celebrate, year anniversary it was to celebrate uh, Canada, the land we call oh, Canada. Yeah, right? Yeah. So, so anyway, so I, I just, and, and then it was just also this idea of, of memorial and remembering and colonial memory and how do we remember. Um, and the whole basis of, sort well, not the whole basis, but, you know, a large part of why this work, this story that Jacques Cartier's version of the story um, is, is believed is because it's written down. It's in the journals, you know, it's, it's, it's archived, it's, it's proof in that way. And so I wanted to make place for the other stories, for the, the the Ganyan Gehaga story, to other voices to come through, other ancestors to come through and, and tell their story. And I was also thinking about, well, what, what is this idea of, of commemoration? Um, how do we commemorate? How do we remember? Uh, the idea of monument. And I sort of came up with this. It was the idea of taking away and liberating the plaque to let other voices come through, to let other stories come through. And what would we commemorate? Well, it's not necessarily meeting Jacques Cartier, probably. <laughs> it's uh, it's the, what do you remember? And it brought me back to the Ohadugarudakwa again. 
that idea of the words that come before else where we honor things and what what do we honor so here it's it's the medicines fire uh, the the sun the moon air uh, land water those are the words that are on that are etched into the different plaques that i that i kind of set free and set forth so it's the idea of words going from one place to another really trying to to liberate them and uh yeah i found it very empowering to to lift that plaque off of the stone metaphorically speaking and and make it weightless make it into the air and to give it these these ganyak geha words so I don't speak I've I've been taking lessons. Um, it's one of the things that I, I find myself very fortunate to be able to do now that I'm here uh, in Ganyakaha territory. And uh, you know, I, I know some words, I can count, I can do colors, this sort of thing, but to really I'm I'm not at all a, a, I'm far from the I'm very, very beginner, I can recognize it. But I, I worked with some um, Hilda Nicholas at the Ganesatagi uh, Language Center, and uh, she's a she's a wonderful person and and enjoys art. She I think probably translated the first catalog, Ryan Rice's catalog, Oso oh Iroquois. She translated the catalog into Ganyangeha, which I just you say wow, you know that's that's amazing. So anyway, um, that's how this that's how this came about. Um, yeah. And again, it's uh, colored acrylic, so you can play with the shadows quite a bit with it. It just multiplies onto the various surfaces that it, that it goes onto. I, lo I love that expansiveness. And I, I mean, uh, at some point, they start to look, they start to look like tongues. You know? <laughs> right? And, uh, I hadn't uh, thought about that before. Yeah. And then what does a, you know, part of what a tongue does is it carries the language carries yeah. the words right yeah yeah even the beginning no, definitely even the beginning speakers you know it, it one word you know for me it's like one one word is speaking your language you know what i mean right like, right well it just uh, you, you feel so moved to, to be able to say these words you know it's so special it's so important and uh yeah i just i, I love I love learning about them and, and repeating them. So that's good. But you're, you're thinking about the tongues that just, I have to mention uh, Catherine Blackburn's piece, which mm. is the tongues and the pins with Cree syllabics written out in, in, in pins on images of a, a tongue with a mouth. Made me think of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. I also, also love this, you know, like part of like, thinking about um, non-colonial, like within that, within that particular space, there is possibility for artists to also regain our jobs uh, as artists for the community, you know? Not just speaking back to colonization or, you know, all those kind of things, which are important parts of our job, but like, it feels to me like you lifted that plaque off so uh, of that stone so that stone could breathe again. Mm. And uh, that to me seems like a, a, a job, which is a, you know, ancestor artist would do that. You know? <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. Rebecca Belmore. <laughs> or Rebecca Belmore. Well, yes. That's she, right. The, That's right. The maestro, the maestro, Rebecca <laughs> Belmore. Oh, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I flipped, I'm, I'm just looking at the time and I'm wondering how long, I know we go till three, we're supposed to have time for questions. Um, yeah, our, I wonder, our, do I keep on, do I keep on going or should we see if people want to join us in talking? Our friend Maya was going to pop in and Let's help see. us with the next part. I'm just going to unshare <laughs> just to check. Hi, Maya. Hello. I feel like I'm appearing. <laughs> well, that's not good. No, come on in. So you have um, 25 minutes left. There are a few questions that have come up in the Q&A um, and some comments I would like to share from you from the chat. But if you want to talk about another piece, we can also um, 
enjoy your your language and your exchanges it's up to you too if i could also just mention um that those of you who are joining us who want to speak, you can raise your virtual hand and we can just unmute you if you want to become part of the dialogue. I didn't say that at the beginning, but. Oh yeah, that'd be but, great. Yeah, yeah. Okay. but I was, am I, are they able to do that when I'm sharing the screen? Is that still possible? Cause I didn't see the chat when I was sharing the screen. It okay. is still possible cause um, whomever joins, sorry, Anna, you were. You were oh. in <laughs> <laughs> it's all possible and okay. <laughs> we'll figure it out. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, Nadia just said, Talk about one more work. So I'm going to listen to my friend. <laughs> and we'll go back to another work. Um, okay. One more work and then we'll... One more work. Let's see. Well, Peter, what work do you think? There's this one. There's also... I've also got the um, Trade of Ceremony series. So maybe I'll just say quickly, this is a work that's... A, a, it's hanging in, in the Law Pavilion. Um, at uh, Queen's University in Kingston. And it's, uh, again, wampum belts. Um, it was a public art work that I did. And uh, it was uh, a, lovely, a lovely experience because the law students wanted to, to have something, the indigenous law students wanted to have something uh, present uh, for their to make to make them visible to make to make their their presence visible and so it was an answer to actually the calls for action from the uh truth and reconciliation um calls to action is what the the, the law faculty decided to put money forward for this so um, I created different wampum belts because these are uh, these are tools um, that are used uh, within their like witnesses that are used within actual judicial proceedings. Um, now they can be they can be acknowledged uh, for the words they hold. So so that's there. The other thing that was lovely is that Queens is uh, very close to Tyndanega, which is. Um, my grandfather's reserve uh, community and which I'm still uh, a member of. So I got to work with some lovely people uh, that, are, that are part of that community to do this. But um, this work, I guess I, it's the last one. So I thought we could talk about this as well. Um, trade is ceremony. And I pulled this up as the last sort of topic was the idea of excellence was how I fit that in. So that was what we'd said we'd talk about. And I thought, what's going to work for that one? Was this the one you thought of for that as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. That's great. That's yeah. great. Um, this is this is when it was up recently also. It was a part of, uh, they were created, they were first shown at the McCord when I had an exhibition there in 2018. And was it 2018 or 2019? Time is like so... So fluid now. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> recently I did have an exhibition there within the last year or so. Um, and uh, they came out of a conversation with uh, some elders out West. And to me, they, they relate to this idea of, we were talking about the idea of excellence. And I mentioned this to, to Jason Lewis and Heather Gugliorzi because we, we had virtual, virtual, tea the other the other night and uh it was sort of like excellence what do you mean about excellence and uh it was really that that idea of i think was it mark meyer the comment from the national gallery about why aren't there more uh black indigenous people of color within the collection was it was it, i don't want to attribute it to the wrong person was it was he the director that I think he, yes, it was. You, there's okay. several comments now saying yes, oh, Okay, you can see the comments. Good, good, good. <laughs> well, it was that idea of excellence. And like, well, we only collect work that is excellence. And again, I'm paraphrasing. Don't, don't quote and sue me. But, but the idea of excellence comes up often, I find. Um, it's, it's something that can motivate, you know, or, or act as like that structuring line for arts councils the awarding of money, the awarding of prizes, the idea of mm -hmm. excellence. 
And it's, it's thinking about things with Elwood Jimmy, who again is just a, a beautiful person and, and thinker um, that, who's, who's Cree. And uh, he, uh, you know, was like this idea of, and it's what I believe as well, and I think you also, this idea of excellence is just not being compatible with indigenous thought. Mm -hmm. And it's not that we aren't excellent, <laughs> but it's that it's the hierarchical nature of it, the, the sort of privileging of something over another, you know? And I think that goes into Cheryl Lerondel's work as well, that idea like in a camp structure, everything has to fit together. Everything is important. There's not something that is lesser than, than another because otherwise you won't survive. You know, it's, it's the idea that everything has to work. So somehow this all, I was able to apply this idea of the blankets because to me, it's that idea of, these are called trade as ceremony. And it became also that idea of, of trade as we understand within our, you know, the, 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 the society within which we live, Western society, trade is an economic transaction, you know. And that idea of people still come up with this idea of wampum being money or trading things for beads that are, that are shiny and oh, didn't we get a good deal and, and this sort of thing in, in the fur trade. And that idea of trade as a transaction is very different than the idea of trade before contact where trade is ceremony. So trade is about relationship. And mm -hmm. it's not to say that trade didn't ever happen prior to contact it was happening a long time ago it's how it's how we got to tobacco it's how we got canoes it's how we got got corn you know it was it was traded and trade routes were extensive and and long but it was about relationship it was a way of creating relationship between peoples between nations mm -hmm. and it was a ceremony it was an engagement towards that relationship towards each other um, so i found that very very profound and um, created these blankets with that in mind about this idea of exchange. So here it's the, the sort of the trade treaty blanket um, and uh, copper, copper head pins, which are kind of like long, long pins. I have a roundish sort of head at the, at the, at the top. And um, I put wampum designs taken from wampum belts uh, to, to sort of suggest this idea of language. And I like the blanket. I know that it, it obviously was the, the losing end of the deal in the fur trade. <laughs> it wasn't as good as a fur to keep you warm, but at the same time, it is something that suggests uh, bodily comfort and warmth covering or protection. Um, and, uh, and then the copper pins as being the, the acknowledgement on them of the exchange, the language, and uh, and values. So the, the the it's that shiny shiny object that uh, that gets repeated. So this is um, pine because there's the pine tree on the one that's on. Um, I guess I can use my little mouse here. This one is <laughs> is sun, which is a circle. And then uh, I believe this is council, the idea of, of uh, council coming together. And then this one is the more recent one, it's called Invaders, and it's specific. It's still in the same series, it's the same idea of trade as ceremony, but it's called Invaders, and it's really drawing from the covenant chain wampum belt, and it uses silver, silver pins. And the covenant chain is, is uh, the sort of a common common name for the agreement where uh, between the, the the Haudenosaunee and the, the British where the uh, the chain was seen as being stronger than rope because it wouldn't fray and it's uh, silver because it wouldn't rust if it were made of iron but at the same time for the silver to remain bright you have to keep polishing it and so this is a symbol taken from one of the covenant chain wampum belts but the link, there's one link on each of them and the link is separate, so it's been broken. And uh, when I was looking at this, when I was doing them in the studio, I thought that kind of looks like the Space Invaders form 
<laughs> from the video game. And so then immediately became Invaders. It was just the title that, that came with that one. So this one is actually sort of a, a triptych. It's like a, the, the three pieces go together for, for Invaders. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's, there's so much to, like now, I feel like now we've gone a little bit full circle as well, because the, you know, the thinking about trade, thinking about, we go back to rivers, mm. right? Uh, the original highways uh, of the people, right? Uh, and the salmon. Uh, and then we also go back to this idea of memory, like memory is embedded or, it, you know, like I, I experience this, I, this sort of like, um, nod towards memory in, in a lot of your work as well. Like, and that there's that fragileness of memory, which is very present. Yeah. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you for this. That's a really beautiful, really beautiful opportunity and sharing. Well, thank you for working through it with me. <laughs> That's what I was hoping. I'm honored. I'm honored always. <laughs> there we go to add to those sentiments, I really valued the careful parsing and working through of, of language that the two of you are bringing to this discussion. And there are a few questions from, from the audience um, to return to a few things that came up along the way or some questions that we haven't been able to, to get to yet. And, and one of them is asking around your, your present concerns and, and interests, Hannah. Um, one of the things that I'm always struck by when I'm able to, to hear you speak about your work is the particularities or attention to, to gesture and storytelling, but then also the, the care of installation and how there's a reciprocity in the space with viewers. What, can we um, hear a bit more about what materials you're drawn to now at the moment or things you're working through? Um, well, the, the current project that uh, needs to get underway is actually it's another suspended installation um, and it's um, looking at the idea of uh, of wind uh, of wind within the uh, within the the world view teachings what what role does it play um, for the Ganya Gehaga and it will result in another suspended installation and then I want to do more of these these blankets uh, I find that's a really rich Sort of territory that that more can come out of that. So those are the the materials at the moment that that I've been looking at. Yeah. There's some sentiments in the in the chat that are are also commenting on the. Uh, the oh, Brenda's there. Hi, Brenda. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. She's an artist on the other side of the other side of that that colonial front uh, boundary there border. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met her in a in a residency down south. That's great. Yay! It's so nice that Zoom can bring people together. I like it. I it's, like it. It's true. We'll be sure to send um, both of you transcripts of this chat because it has a lot of wonderful um, comments and parallel to things that you were saying and and hellos and uh, Jake was commenting Hannah on your Catherine Blackburn pieces. Uh, yes, I should say, okay, acknowledge, acknowledge the artist, it's <laughs> Catherine Blackburn on my ears, I was saying I needed some earring medicine when I started this off, so, yes. <laughs> There's uh, another specific question about your processes of, of making, Hannah, if you can indulge us again to, to speak about materials and, and representations or thinking around gestures in your work. Um, this question comes from Theresa van der Meerschijks, and she <laughs> asks, how do you represent broken relationships? Broken relationships. Well, I think it depends um, sort of on the specific idea and the material. I didn't, I didn't show these works, these works, because I, I know when Peter and I start to talk that I have to kind of limit how much I can show. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a series of work that I did that was that were that were teacups, um, and the, the there was one installation in the cord uh, with these these teacups uh, in the sort of rings, uh, like a, a mandala, kind of like the the carpet idea, the the sort of cir concentric circles, and uh, it would alternate with um, cedar and berries in, in one ring and then teacups in another ring and alternate that way. 
and uh, I was talking about this idea of, of uh, never really appreciating tea until I had uh, indigenous teas like, like cedar tea and its place um, in, our, in our histories. So I was talking with Jolene Ricard about that, who's a Tuscarora scholar. And uh, she's like, well, I know what you, how you talk about it and what you said, but I'm not buying it. You're talking about this, these, you know, uh, two identities, cultures coming together, coexisting. Eh, I'm not buying it. Cause you know, if you try and pour hot water into that teacup, it's going to melt. So I'm just saying that, you know, that's, that's what I take away. And I was like, you know, Jolene, I think I now have to make that into another installation. <laughs> so I did another installation where the, the cups are, are actually melted, melted away. And it's sort of the, the remnant of the cup with, uh, again, cedar, but the cedar is sort mm -hmm. of taking over in, in, that, in that sense. So, I mean, that, that can be, it's, so I guess to answer Teresa's question, it is, it's depending on the material and the idea at hand, that seemed appropriate there. And uh, in this one, like I showed in Invaders, normally the links are one, you know, attached together uh, in, in the wampum belt. And here the links have now been very definitely taken apart. So um, there's, there's different ways. We can always show things in, in what we create for sure. Peter, feel free to, to come in with any of the, the questions if they catch your eye or if there are elements that you, you also want to return to uh, from the conversation. But I'm, I'm curious if the two of you would um, like to share your prep for this, this talk. Uh, I know in the audience there are a lot of emerging artists, some who are students at the moment who might be thinking about how to address audiences, to speak about processes of making. And the two of you have chosen such a particular mode of engaging with each other as friends as well as colleagues and you share a kinship in how you talk about work. Um, would you mind sharing with us a bit of the backstage of how you prepped for today? Actually, mm. actually, uh, can I ask a question first before we do that? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, Hannah, um, tell us about Daphne. Oh yes, yeah. that's supposed to be <laughs> so, so not good. Um, listen, Daphne, um, this, uh, and it, I mean, maybe this kind of relates to the, like, like I said, Peter and I met on the ACC. We talk about uh, the Aboriginal Curator Collective. We talk about ideas and projects. We find commonalities. We become friends. Um, Daphne is uh, an artist run Indigenous art center that uh, exists, we have the paperwork, proves it exists, <laughs> we got a grant, we have actual physical money and we've got our programming right, like that, that was set up. Uh, we now need to find the physical space, but it was, it's an idea that really came out of many conversations between many people. It's just, I think we finally felt like, let's just do it, we need to make this, but it's uh, Scalinati, Nadia Mir, Caroline Monet, and I, all for various, you know, reasons feel like there just absolutely had to be an Indigenous artists run center here in Jotjage, Muniang. So um, there, there is, there will be, it's going to, the website is almost finished, it's going to happen. But uh, it comes out of conversations. Um, Scalinati was saying it's something she was thinking back when she was doing Nation to Nation with Ryan Rice and Eric Robertson, which is Oh, Lord Scalinati, how long ago was it? 25 years ago, maybe? I'm not sure. Something like that. It was like when they were just students in, in at Concordia, you know? Like, so it, the idea's been there for a long time. It's something that I realized the, the Francophone Indigenous community um, artists, which I interact with, um, you know, and, and more and more people are interacting with, needs to have a place to, to come and gather. Uh, we need a place to come and gather. So it's going to be an exhibition space as well as a place to just have regular meetings to do like we're doing and just talk about art. Basically, we need a place to talk about art. But for Peter and my prep, I mean, we meet on Facebook and say, you got time for a video chat and start, start talking. And what do you think about this or that? And help each other out with things. We collaborated on an exhibition together 
here at Oberl in 2017 and had lots of beautiful things come out with that. So it's just a, a series of engagements. But I think to me, that's what was most important about university and the graduate program was the idea of finding community. Um, personally, when I went back to grad school, I've been out of it for a while and, and you start to feel alone and ungrounded because you're the oddball person at the dinner party who when they ask what do you do when you say you're an artist they think you're being pretentious or crazy or or whatever and it's not it's normal <laughs> it's yeah. normal it's a normal <laughs> thing right so residencies grad programs these are all places that we need to create and value and, and protect and, and help grow basically and and try and make those happen wherever we can so particularly for indigenous artists and and people of color uh, you know um asian artists whatever like we we have issues uh that the and, and have to deal with with things that that maybe non-indigenous people don't need to consider it's 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 harder to make a place for for us for our work for our ideas um now our work is out there are the ideas always understood I don't know that the ideas are always understood. Like that's important too. You need you need infrastructure for things to, to happen and grow. So that's I'm on the board of of uh, Montreal Arts Council, the, the Conseil des Arts de Montréal, and it's about you know the focus um, on making infrastructure, having programs there with mentors and, and mentees and residencies, along with creation grants to try and just get something really solid and, and grounded growing. Yeah. So that was a good little diatribe. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's great. <laughs> uh, also, there is a fundraiser for Daphne. Oh, so, yes. Yeah. Again, what else did you mention? <laughs> um, someone but could I, copy that into the chat. It's uh, so GoFundMe. If you, if you do a GoFundMe for Daphne, you'll see it. And, and I guess I want to mention, too, the reason why we, uh, we had this... this uh, named Daphne. Uh, it's to to honor, to remember Daphne Ojik, who's our, our grandmother artist, uh, the, the first um, commercial commercial artist working at the same time as Norval Morisot, but who often is not known. If you know Norval Morisot, chances are you don't necessarily know Daphne Ojik. She created a space. She was the first one to create the space for people to come together, her, her Indigenous colleagues, and, and band together to help support each other, learn, get out, get exhibitions, and and grow together. So it was a, it was a really appropriate name um, for what we wanted to create with the Art Influence Center. Yeah. And when you hear Daphne Ojig talk about this space, because it is the first commercial gallery opened by an Indigenous woman, Indigenous mm -hmm. person in mm -hmm. Canada, located in um, Winnipeg. Uh, when you hear her talk about it, she says, we needed a place to show our work and we also needed a place to sit and talk about ideas with each other. It's so important. Yeah. Yes. Which is yeah. exactly what Hannah just said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. what we do, right? That's mm -hmm. what we do. So, yeah. Maybe as a, a thread on from that, idea of, of gathering and talking together and as a way of winding down our conversation for today there are um, a few questions in in the chat relating to what is upcoming for for both of you how can we stay in touch with what you're up to or are there particular projects um definitely of course being an important one to to stay in breast to uh, where where um, people can follow what you're what you're working on um, well, I'll do a little plug for MFA Concordia students. I need research assistants <laughs> to help me make my work. <laughs> so if you're interested in my ideas, get in touch. Um, I've got an exhibition happening uh, at the Macintosh Gallery um, at Western, Western University in February. So that's kind of the, the next imminent deadline. Got a studio to set up. <laughs> That's imminent right now, walls being painted. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Peter, what are you up to? Um, I currently am 
uh, the graduate program director for the IAMD um, master's program at OCAD University. Um, and I'm trying to uh, do more work um, back home uh, in our territory, Taltan Nation territory. Also, um, Marie Cote, Zia Tabasan, uh, and I, and a few other folks are gonna make an album. Hey, nice, <laughs> nice, nice, nice. All around COVID, right? Getting around COVID. Okay, wait, Nadia is saying IMDB. What is it? And I was going to say the same thing. You're using acronyms that we I don't know. know. I know. What? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's terrible. It's terrible. Uh, it's the acronym stands for Interdisciplinary Masters in Art, Media, and Design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's what I'm doing, uh, working at... I mean, I, we're all doing all of the things, you know, like we, you know, and I'm, <laughs> we I, do. Have, I have two essays, which are super behind. Um, I hope, I hope the people who aren't waiting for those are in the thing here, hearing me say that out loud, but maybe they are, <laughs> they're coming. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> all, all doing the things that get the things. So thank you for, for your energy and your generosity for this afternoon and finding the time to, to share your ideas and conversation when there are a lot of other things that are, are asking for our attention. And I'd also like to thank everybody for joining us this afternoon. Please feel free to pass on your reflections and thanks in the chat and we'll send it along to Hannah and Peter as like a postcard from this conversation, <laughs> a little vessel that captures all of this nice energy. Uh, I'd also like to thank Force Space for this digital hospitality and to thank Karen Zippiger and Joni Chung for helping with the um, publicity of, of getting the word out that this talk was happening. Um, time is, is fleeting uh, these days, so it was nice to get the word out and welcome everybody to the space. So thank you both again so much um for for your reflections today it was like a bomb on on an anxious anxious soul on the, on this side for sure speaking for me so thank you thank you Goa, to all of you for everything for making this happen it really was great thank you so much and thank you hannah beautiful work and, and you too lovely <laughs> Awesome. Thanks. Uh, thanks, everybody. I'll just echo um, what Maya has said about the chat. There's a lot of comments coming in now and a lot of love being felt. So we'll be sure to pass that on to both of you because I know it's a lot to try to be engaged in conversation. Look over here, look over there, talk to that person. So we'll make sure to forward that to you. And uh, just a quick reminder that a recording of this conversation is going to be on our um, Sika playlist, which is on our website, concordia.ca slash four. Uh, It'll probably show up there tomorrow or early next week at the latest. So you can tune back in. Do people still tune things? Sure. Why not? We're, yes. Okay. Beautiful. <laughs> awesome. So <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thanks for your time and energy and uh, for being here with us. We really appreciated it. So on that note, we wish you a good afternoon. Yeah. Bye. See you. Bye. Thank you. Anna.